Can you imagine a thousand people joining your church a week? Well, this is about the coming move of God and the history of revival. And Rick Joyner is sharing with us very specifically what the Lord has shown him. You better get ready. Awesome things are coming. Well, you think about it. You think about Gideon. I don't know if you remember Gideon or heard about Gideon, but he was a, a, an Israeli. He was a Jew. He was uh, eking out a living. Things have been really bad. They've been in a time of oppression, oppressive government. The, the particular government that was over them at the time was oppressive. And just he had to be in a wine press, eking out a living. And all of a sudden, the Lord shows up in the midst of this great governmental oppression, in the midst of nobody remembering what God did historically, and looks at Gideon and says, mighty man of valor. You know, and here he is in the midst of Eek, Eek Incorporated, Eek and not 11, right? He looks up at this angel and he's looking like, mighty man of valor. And that was the beginning of God reviving Israel. I mean, it looked bleak. It looked difficult. It looked, it looked really tough. But understand, that's how we all, it always comes to that point. That we're at the most humblest point. And the darkest moment of the night is right before the dawn in the morning. And I don't want you to give up hope. I want you to realize all along the reason why we're doing what we're doing, you know, at VFN, the VFN Dream Center, and VFN TV, is to encourage you. We see a future. We see, we hear the sound of rain coming, and we wanted to be able to help you get through this situation as we come out into the light. And first today, I want to remind you of the history of revival in America, the many moves of God and all the Many of the men and women that are being used by God, and we're going to look back at the, at the life of Elijah, not Gideon, and, and see uh, what happened in the history. It'll, it'll get you really encouraged because sometimes it's, you're feeling that your worst, God's about to do his greatest thing. Let's take a look. Keep on forever. He gave his life. He says, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down. No one I ever talked to that had had an experience was sorry. I want to see somebody shot without music. I want to see somebody shot without drums. Smith Wigglesworth prophesied in 1947 these words. When the current church phase is on the decline, there will be something that has not been seen before. It will be a coming together of those with an emphasis on the Word and those with an emphasis on the Spirit. When the Word and the Spirit come together, there will be the biggest movement of the Holy Spirit that the nation and indeed the world has ever seen. It will mark the beginning of a revival that will eclipse anything that has been witnessed. God! Bring forth a Jesus movement where everyone's getting saved. Signs and wonders in the streets leading to stadium. This is so exciting. Do you think about it? You know, we're seeing history and things that took place. If God's done it before, He can do it again. And in some of the bleakest times, God begins to move. So I want to encourage you. You know, maybe seven, eight years ago, people thought that we didn't need revival. We didn't need to turn to God. And now we're hearing people unify and coming together and to cry out to God. And we're beginning to see the, the, the beginning stages of, of, of rain 
the, the blessings of God being uh, poured down in revival. It's about to take place in the nation, and I believe the world. Join us after the break because we're going to talk in detail about this. Make sure you join us. Isn't that so exciting, Steve, to be able just to see history? Yes. You know, and, and I think about um, the Lord's just really been speaking to me about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Some things I can share, and things, some things I can't share. And, uh, but one is, you know, when you look back at the 60s and the 70s that birthed a lot of these folks today yeah. that are doing what they're doing, but there was a powerful move of God at the very same time. Yeah. And uh, we're showing, I think we're going to go back to that time again. Where you're, it's going to be common to see tr people in transient, you know, people just, mm -hmm. just you know, living off the land and, and doing different things. They had like the hippie movement that was going on in the 60s. And, um, but uh, in that, you had this powerful, you know, charismatic movement. But, but in that time, great tragedy was taking place. You yeah. think about it. You think about that, um, you know, President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. In 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated like in 1968. Senator Robert Kennedy, President John F. Kennedy's brother, while he was running for president, was assassinated like a month later after Dr. King. You had uh, Roe versus Wade where people were saying, you know, um, let's kill our children. You know, they began to say, you know, let's abort our children. Divorce became, you know, be the beginning, the seedbed of, of divorce was sown to where you know, you had to have cause to divorce someone back then. You couldn't just say, I'm going to divorce mm -hmm. you. You know, you had to go to court and prove that there was a violation, really, of biblical standards to be able to have a divorce. That was just hours ago. And then all this movement, of which our, you know, Secretary Hillary Clinton takes a lot of credit for that, that, that move. And she's talking about Planned Parenthood, and she's talking about that she, she walked or was participating in the time of Gloria Steinem mm -hmm. and the woman thing that was going on at the time. And now here we are today, and nobody really knows who they are or what's going on. It's like, you can say, well, that's a negative thing. Well, of course it's a negative thing. It's, it's the adversary beating up on mankind, but understand this. But in the midst of all that, when it looks that bad and droughts happen, that's when all of a sudden God says, now I'm going to move. Now that there's no water anywhere, you can't find any grass for your cattle, that you can't find any milk for your children, that you cannot find a place to lay your head, now you'll know. He says in Hosea chapter 2, as a matter of fact, in Hosea chapter 2, the book, it's a Hosea, it's a book by a prophet named Hosea. In chapter 2, he talks about that, you know, I gave you all these things and that, mm -hmm. you know, you begin to worship the things that I gave you. And then you begin to make them your lover. And then you begin to uh, turn to them and say, you know, your jo my job is the one that's giving, giving me this money. My hands are what's giving me this money. And, uh, you know, the American government is what's giving me this, that kind of thing. And so what God says, I'm going to take it all from you. That's right. I'm going to take everything from you. Everything from you. And I'll cause an environment to get to a certain point that you won't want your lovers, the things that you're in love with, whether it's government or business or money, you won't even want, any, it won't anything to do with, you just, you just want, y'all just repel each other. That's what he's going to do. So even the very thing that you love to do, that, you, that, that God says don't do, you'll even begin to repel it. Nothing will please you. And he says he does this in Hosea chapter 2. He takes you into the wilderness, into a dry place. And that's what happened in the time with Israel when God told uh, Elijah, he said, you know, I want you to tell government something. I want you to tell them this. I want you to tell the king. It was King Ahab, but it's the government. I want you to tell them that it's not going to rain. And it's real difficult to do. I mean, you know, anybody that moves prophetically, you're always living beyond the hill, and people are always wondering. We finally got here, and it's like, yeah, but God has me on the other side of the hill now. I'm, ba I'm past this hill. Yeah, enjoy Boy. yourself. I've been there a while. I'm going to go to the other side. And so he, of course, the government looks at the church and goes, really? For real? Mm -hmm. I didn't even pay attention to it. But you know what? Drought hit. It didn't rain. And the agricultural society, you think about it, an agricultural society that does not have rain, if your cows don't have rain, if your, yeah. you know, your, your, your wheat doesn't have rain, your, your grain doesn't have rain, nothing has rain, you don't have rain to be able to drink in your aquifers or anything of that nature, that um, you're going to starve. No crops, that's right. Your cows are going to starve. Everybody's going to, it's not going to be good. And so in that, that um, drought began to happen for three and a half years. Because a man believed God, a man listened to God. And this is so important because God speaks. And you'll start doubting God's voice because so many people refuse to think that He speaks or they don't want to hear what He has to say. 
They don't want a profit to come anywhere near them because they're scared that their profit will change their nonprofit. <laughs> mm. You know, a nonprofit is not just a corporation mindset for quite a lot of people. They don't want any profits around because they got a vision, they got a plan, and they're going to do something. And they don't want people coming around telling them what God's saying. <laughs> so mess it up. Yeah. Versus like, hey, let's just drop everything. If God says something different, do what he's saying. Yeah. And so he, he believed God and he spoke that prophetic word out. Is he a meteorologist? No, he wasn't somebody that determined the weather. No, he wasn't. He was just a typical, ordinary man. He says about in the book of James. But God told him, I don't know if it was in a dream. I don't know if it was a, a directly. I believe it may have been in a dream. And just said, you know, just tell him it's not going to rain. Can you imagine going to the President of the United States and saying, I just want to let you know, you know, that uh, it's, God said it's not going to rain. It's like, Secret Service, could you get, uh, we got another one of those prophet guys here in the White House. And, um, but he did, and yeah. it didn't rain for three and a half years, and that's so serious. We have a lot of reserves in America, but there's no reserves at that particular time. And so imagine now, after three and a half years of famine, what's going to happen? I'll tell you what's going to happen. God's going to speak again. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a time when God speaks, and you're going to have to go through a season where you're not hearing him. You don't hear God, but you have to remember what he said. People who don't know God, people who follow their flesh, people who live off the natural things of the land, they'll beat the stew out of you. They'll try to destroy you. They'll call you a liar. They'll say all these different things. They'll go, hey, I want to go play with my toys. And, and you got to hold on. you got to hold on because God said there's, a, there's something he's doing here. He wasn't just trying to deprive God's people or, or the people of the land of water. That's not what he was trying to do. He was trying to show them that he's the one that provides the water. Ahab, the king, the government at the time, was worshiping Baal and Asherah and Dagon, and you know, saying that, that that was God and that's who provided for them. And it wasn't, but just like Hosea, he's saying, you're giving these fake gods credit that's right. for what's going on. And that's not true. As a matter of fact, I'll back off the one who actually causes the rain, and we'll just see if your gods, Jezebel, if your gods, Ahab, actually caused things to rain. Of course they didn't, mm -hmm. they were all thirsty in three and a half years, right? <laughs> and so God speaks to Elijah and says, you know, go tell the government now it's about to rain. And so he goes and tells King Ahab, the government, he says, you know, you better hurry up and get back to your, you know, to the White House. You know, you better get back to the to your to the government, get to your to your place, because you gotta beat the rain. It's gonna rain, it's gonna rain so much. It's going to rain so much that you might not be able to make it there. I mean, think about it. This comes from a time of no rain at all. There's like no, it is so dry. I mean, they're out of chapstick. You know what I'm saying? It's just dry. <laughs> it's dry as can be. But you got to be brave enough. You got to be brave enough. Forget about what people think about. Who cares? You're going to stand eternity with God. You're going to get to heaven with all them folks. They're going to look at you and go, I'll be doggone. <laughs> he was absolutely God. And so you had to be able to say there's not going to be rain when it was just rain yesterday. You may have rain dripping down your face. But if God told you there's not going to be no rain, and he told you you need to prophesy to the, to the government, and you need to tell them there's not going to be a rain, it might not be for Ahab. It wasn't for Ahab. Ahab was going to die with an arrow through his, through, his, through his armor. Jezebel was going to be trampled to death under a whole bunch of horses. It was for all the people that were following. It was the people that were watching the story play out around them. So may God may be having you taught the government or authority, not for the authority's sake. They may have made up their mind they're going against God. But everybody else that follows them hears you say that. And so when he delivered that word uh, that there was going to be a drought, he probably was still wet from yesterday's rain. But now it's been three and a half years with no rain. The government's out looking for some fuel for their trucks, or basically this is what was going on. They were out looking for grass for their horses because there was no, they couldn't find grass anywhere. And, if, and all of a sudden he runs into Elijah. And just in case, in case you don't know this, the government hated the prophet because every time he prophesied, it was like, oh, you're just giving me hard words, as if he was yeah. making those words up himself. And he would credit the prophet for the words versus mm -hmm. God speaking to him. Man, God's speaking to you right now. I want you to encourage you to pay attention because... I mean, you don't want to miss God. And Ahab, the government, actually thought it was mankind. He thought it was a political party. He thought it was some sort of, it's God speaking to us even right now in America. But anyway, so here he's so dry. Everything is so dry. 
here again he has to go to government and he has to say in the presence of dryness you know just parched land and empty aquifers and and not even grass not even brown grass it's just just dead stuff he had to look somebody square in the eye and say it's going to rain it's going to rain and it's going to rain so bad that if you don't get on your horse and you get back to your palace you're not going to make it there these are people that fear God. When you're willing to do that, and there's a lot of people do that because that's what they want, and they're not hearing from God. But I'm talking about if you hear from God, I mean, God needs some people that's going to repeat what he tells them to say. Because people need to understand that God speaks. If you haven't gone to easy12.org, just, just look how God speaks, easy12.org. But he speaks. He's constantly speaking. The question is, are we listening to him, and are we following what he's saying? And so here, here he was talking to this dry king. I'm sure he actually crackled mm -hmm. when he rode on his horse. It was so dry. Probably the horse was all shriveled up looking at bones and stuff out there. The horse was like, <gasps> and this, you know, sweat on their stuff. So here, look at this. But he was brave enough to look and say, you know what? It's going gonna, it's gonna to rain. It's going to rain so bad that you're not going to make it back to your palace. But you know what he had to do? He had to go back and begin to pray. Mm hmm so many people prophesy, but they never pray. He actually had to pray that it would happen as God called it to be. He had to call in the rain. Yeah. So many people say, this is what God told me, but have you even prayed? Have you even asked? I thank God for those that are in the VFN prayer and fasting mm -hmm. community because they Speaking, ask God believing. continually oh, yes. and pray. And we're seeing so many answers to prayer. It is amazing. But just because God says it doesn't mean it's going to happen unless we get in agreement with heaven what's going on. Mm -hmm. And you can do that. Imagine if the church begins to pray the will of God and what he's saying. And so he sent his servant out there to look up if he saw anything in the clouds. Now, he already has the word out there already. It's already broadcasted mm -hmm. around the world. You know, they're picking it up in South Korea going, you know, uh, Greg Lancaster says it's going to rain, right? <laughs> And so, you know, he's got his head between his knees basically going, Dear God, let it rain now, you rain. know? And... Uh, he sends his servant out there and he says, what do you see? And it was probably was Pat. He's coming back and I don't see nothing. <laughs> it doesn't look like rain. It's as dry as it possible to right be. Now. Probably shouldn't have said that. No, he didn't. It's not what Pat would say. But the thing about it is, is that he didn't see anything. Yeah. He was honest. So he said, let's pray some more. So he, he prays some more and he says, go look again. And he says, what are you seeing? And eventually God showed him that there was an army, a host of army of all of God's angels around him. Do you know you have, God is just, orchestrating an outpouring for the world. That's what he's doing right now. We can either cooperate with him and prepare for what he's going to do, or we could allow the flood to flow right over us and go, you know, I knew about that, but I just missed the whole thing, right? This is what God, God is preparing for an outpouring. He's preparing for such a huge wave mm -hmm. of his glory to hit this earth, but you have to understand what happens. You have to begin to pray and get in agreement. Don't be in agreement with the drought. Get in agreement with a God who's getting get with God who's actually getting everybody ready to cry out for rain. Mm -hmm. And so he looks around and he sees God gives him the ability to see in the heavenlies how the heavenly host is gathered all around them, and God was getting ready to just start raining. He says, "Wait a minute, I think I see a cloud, but it's the size of a man's hand." Elijah quits praying. It's done. It's a done deal. Isn't it awesome? Mm -hmm. He tucked in his 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 his, his uh, cloak in his rebox. <laughs> He took off and, um, and, and, and beats the king to his place. Yeah. Imagine how exciting this is that you know, get involved with what God's saying. You know what happened? Just like God said, it, it began to pour. And God brought a whole nation and confronted their false gods and their image and Baal and Dagon and Asherah and brought all of Jezebel's prophets in and you call, down all, call down fire. You're, you know, God the answers by fire. And mm -hmm. It just happened. But it began understanding the drought that we're in. We're fixing to go to a break right here. We're going to come back. We're going to continue talking about this. But understand, just like we saw historically in what's taking place in the moves of God, move of God, we have to get in alignment and agreement with heaven and begin to call down what God is saying. And this is what God's saying. God is saying this. He's saying that there's a billion soul harvest coming. A billion souls coming in the kingdom of God. And not just a billion, just any age souls. Young folks coming into the kingdom of God. A great harvest is going to begin in 2020. Right now, you need to become a disciple. If you know Jesus Christ, but you've never been discipled, you've got to get discipled because God's going to need you to participate in the harvest. 
If you don't know Jesus, you need to meet him. Before this program's up, we'll tell you how to, how to actually meet him. This is not exciting. If you missed our beginning of our program, we're talking about, you know, God has been speaking mm. about a great harvest, a great revival from the way that, the way that I'm actually seeing what God is showing me and others as it's so large. Yeah. There's so many people that God is preparing their hearts. They've tried everything. They've done everything. They've tasted everything. They've touched everything. They've get, all, God gave them over to everything that, that, like the prodigal. And they realize, you know what? This is not God. Yeah. Not found in this, this is empty. God, you, God will never let you completely fill up the God-shaped hole in your mm -hmm. life. I mean, God is the only one that can fill that up. It's true. But when he fills it up, when he fills it, when he fills it up, I mean, you have this peace that passes all understanding. That's right. There's nothing like it. Somebody says, you know, why do you do what you do? Because God filled my heart up with the love and His presence. And it's like, how else, what else can we do? Yeah. And how could we not be willing to pass it to the next generation? Why would we just hoard it to ourselves? And God's been preparing us and many folks to, for what's about to take place. Imagine a thousand people a week. I want you to hear, this is what God, God told Rick Joyner of Morningstar Ministries. A thousand, imagine a thousand people a week coming into your church. You know, so many people, mm -hmm. you know, your church gathering, so many people are like, you know, uh, you know, Bob, you know, he visited the church last week and we're so glad to have Bob. Let's show him where the Sunday school class is and you know, those kind of things. Now imagine having a thousand Bobs come in that, that week. And so a thousand, and then imagine the next, next week, week a another thousand, more. thousand <laughs> yeah. another thousand people get saved, and they're trying to find people who mm. know Jesus. And as you heard earlier in the program, you know, Pastor John Kilpatrick of Church of His Presence, and he was prophesying. He said, "Listen, if they can't come to Christians, that they can't come to the church to find the answers, where are they going to go?" Gonna find them. That's right. So you need to get discipled. You need a disciple is somebody, not somebody who says they're a disciple. A disciple is someone who actually knows Jesus, made Jesus the Lord of their life who actually gets into God's Word, finds mm -hmm. out what His teachings are, what He says, how we're to live our life, a Christian lifestyle, and we actually, you're gonna, it's gonna shock you, we actually follow it. I mean, if He says Excellent. take a right, do it. if, we say, if yeah. Jesus says take a right, that's not interpreted, let's take a vote. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? We just take a right. He's God. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not a democracy with God. It, he's God, but it's okay. He loves you. He's got a great plan for your life. But imagine, in this harvest, this is what's coming. And so, becoming a disciple, you, first of all, you want to be a disciple. Secondly, you want to be prepared to make disciples. Only disciples can make disciples. You know, we got, we got evangelists are going to do their job. They're the ones that go out and just scream and holler and, you know, and God moves and people get excited. Then they blow up. Blow in. Blow in, blow, blow up, out. and blow out. And you're left with the whole harvest. And you have to That's actually right. raise the harvest. And they did what they're supposed to do. But you got to be prepared to disciple yeah. those believers. Clean them up, raise them up. Listen to what listen to what Rick Joyner, what the Lord showed him. These times are harvest times. Think about this: How would your church handle a thousand new members every week? And we all think that would be incredible. It will kill you. We've got to start thinking like that. I tell you, we, we need to raise up hundreds of thousands of teachers. The evangelism is going to happen. Evangelists are getting anointed. This is going to happen. We need teachers ready to take new believers and get them established soundly on sound doctrine and made disciples, not just converts. One of the greatest reasons for the greatest weakness, I think, today is we've been making converts instead of disciples. No, the Great Commission is to make disciples, and we've got to be that first if we're going to make others. <clears throat> we need hundreds of thousands of people equipped right now to heal the sick, to cast out demons, to preach the gospel, to lay a solid foundation in new believers' lives, what I'm saying is we've got to fulfill the Ephesians 4 mandate to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. It is not going to work on the model of ministry that is now demonstrated in much of the church. Where you, it's like a spectator sport. You, you pay your 
entry fee and come watch a few people do it every week. No, we've all got to be engaged. I believe there's a home group movement and we've had many and great ones. I believe you're going to have home groups in every single neighborhood that are, that are solid, where God is moving, where he is doing awesome things every week, every day, and where people are bonded together. So could you imagine 1,000 people? There's No building's going to contain this. Yeah. No building, is, by the way, just to relieve you a little bit of pressure here, you are the building of God. Mm -hmm. That's what he says in the words. You are the building of God. You know, God's workmanship. He's working on you. When God's talking about sin in the temple, you know, he's not talking about something happening in, in your building up the street. Mm -hmm. He's talking about sin inside of us. In our, in our hearts. Yeah. Yeah, and the judgment begins in the house of God. He's not talking about the building on Mr. Boulevard or Mrs. Boulevard up the street. He's talking about sin in our hearts. Yeah. When, he, when he says that the reason why your house is desolate is because my house is desolate, that's interpreted in the new covenant that he's talking about that we're not filling ourselves up with the Word of God. But the exciting thing is that's what we're designed for. Mm -hmm. This is our purpose in life. This is where we find joy and fulfillment and eternity is for real. And we have a little moment in time to be able to prepare for it. And there's not a greater feeling than to see the next generation get on fire for God. And we just set them on spiritual fire and watch them burn for God. Yeah. This is a very intelligent uh, generation and they know what to do. God's gonna, gonna raise them up in a powerful way. And it's like an Azusa 2.0 that we're gonna begin to see. And we talked about Azusa 2.0 or Azusa Now yeah. at the Angel it was it Angelus Stadium. It was in uh, the uh, Los Angeles Stadium. Yeah, it was an uh, sort of the, uh, A, it was one that Billy Graham was at that was there. That's okay, but anyways, the California uh, Anaheim Stadium where they were there just crying out for a second Azusa Street. And that's some, some of the words the Lord told us was, you know, Azusa 2.0. I was on a sabbatical spending some time with the Lord just trying to hear from God. And um, as I was going, the Lord talked to me about Azusa Street, which was like 1908 or 1906. 1906. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I found out I was going to be staying in my address that God had me at during that time was 1906. Yeah. I'm like, hmm. It takes a lot from me, right? <laughs> and so then I'm cut off from all this communication, you know, this communication with God, but for some reason my phone rings. And guess who it is? It's an African pastor calling me. And if you don't know this or not, but the Azusa Street was from an African-American pastor. His name was William Seymour. Mm -hmm. And this, this African-American, African pastor, not African-American, African pastor, he begins to tell me, he's saying, he just begins to cry out and he says, he says, what America needs is a second Azusa Street, another Azusa Street. I'm like, goodness, <laughs> well, so how am I getting this call and how is he calling me, you know? And it's like, just like Elijah, we just have to hold fast. There's that time of drought. There's that time that everybody gets prepared. God speaks. You look around the moment he speaks and nobody's interested because they're in their faults areas of their life. But then God says, oh, they'll get interested. Mm -hmm. They'll get thirsty. They'll get hungry. And then you go through a time of drought. And all of a sudden people are like, all the things that used to distract them, they don't distract them anymore. They begin to cry out, you know, help us. Yeah. Parents that didn't think they needed God begin to cry out because their kids are going through crisis. Spouses didn't think they needed God because they had their marriage. All of a sudden they're crying out to God because their marriage is crumbling. All of a sudden people who thought they had their government that didn't need God, they're watching their government go cuckoo gaga, right? It's crazy. Yeah. And they begin to say, government, there's no hope in government. And they begin to cry out for God. And then all of a sudden, it just begins to rain a second Azusa Street. So prior to Azusa Now, which took place for Lou Engle, mm -hmm. you know, it was just a powerful move of God where it opened up with, I think, the Korean church began to speak a blessing because of World War, or the Korean War. Yeah. They wanted to come as saying thank you to America, the American soldiers, the people to sacrifice for South Korea so that South Korea could be free. If South Korea, if this American soldier would not have went to to Korea, it would be all like North Korea. North Korea, it's because of regime and yeah, Kim Jong-un, I mean, and, and he's playing a big role in a lot of the dark things that are taking place right now. 
but because Americans went there and died to bring freedom to Korea, South Korea, that's why we actually have so many different mm -hmm. blessings today and they're blessed today. So they came to Azusa now saying, listen, we want to say thank you. We want to be the ones that open up the Azusa now. So the nations came from everywhere. Right. And you think about that very gathering that took place on the West Coast was that Lowingo was moving yeah. in agreement with the prophetic word that William yeah. Seymour delivered in yeah. 1906 saying, yes, God is moving now. But in about a hundred years, God is going to move in a greater way that's far going to surpass everything that we're seeing now back in 1906. So a hundred years forward, plus, it, and Louisville talks more about this in Azusa now, but that is what was taking place when Louisville was gathering. And all the churches coming from all over the world was that, do it again, God. Do, do it again. again. The young folks. I mean, we, yeah. we showed the program. We've got to see it. Hopefully we'll make it reference to you on VFNTV.com. But the young folks cried out. And they said, listen, let's make a covenant. The way you make a covenant is you yeah. take off your shoes and say, listen, I'll go. And all these yes. shoes came off of the we'll entire go. stadium. These young folks saying, we'll go. And guess what? God's still going to take you up on that. That's right. <laughs> right? Even if you may have changed your foot. And he'll, he, if you'll commit to God, he'll commit to you. This is what God's wanting. God's mm -hmm. wanting someone to believe him. You know, Joyce Meyer said this, and I totally agree with it. He says, the, the issue with the church is that we have a whole bunch of unbelieving believers. Mm. I mean, do we believe God? Does God have to move like a microwave in your life? If he, does, if he gives a prophetic word, does it have to happen within a week, or you, all of a sudden you walk away from God? If, if it doesn't happen in the context of a month or happen within the first five years of your walk with God, are you just going to throw your hands up? If God tells you that He's going to deliver a whole nation through you, but all of a sudden you've got to go through times of rejection from your father, or times of rejection from your brothers like Joseph did, times of being thrown into a pit, you know, which really could stand for preachers in training. You're at a church and a ministry thinking, how did I get here? This is not my concept of ministry. This one guy says, you know, I prayed for a church and I got a whole bunch, a church full of preacher killers. They're trying to kill me. <laughs> they, like the last seven didn't make it. Wow. And so it's it, so that pr that time of, of of pressure. But you had the call. Remember the dream that God gave jo Joshua, Joseph. And so you got to hold on to what God said. Then he gets sold into slavery. Well, it be getting killed because they were going to kill him. So here he is. Here he is now. He's in slavery. He's working for Potiphar. I mean, just think about that. How many people, when things get tough, I think that's it. Like, I'm only getting fourteen dollars and ninety five cents an hour. I'm like. <laughs> Americans, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? It's like, let's get, we're the richest pe people in the whole world. Mm -hmm. Our poorest person's richer than 70% of the world's population. But all of a sudden, times get difficult, and people just start saying, well, forget, I can't remember. What, what did the Lord say about me? I can't remember that prophetic word. Well, Joseph held on to it. Mm -hmm. Then he began to work in government. He began to work for the governor, basically, and, and work in Potiphar's house and, and be the manager of all his things. And he got promoted from slavery to that. And you're thinking, well, this is great. I'm not going to sell out this union job for God. I gotta, I'm got going to stay with this government. No, he didn't. He didn't sell out God. He stayed with God. Even when, and when he stayed with God, that meant he had to say, you know, I can't sleep with the boss's wife. Mm -hmm. Because she actually wanted to, to, uh, to, to falsely accuse him. Well, no, she actually wanted to commit we, adultery with him, or him to commit adultery with her, and she couldn't. He ran so fast, he ran straight out of his clothes and took off running, trying to honor God and honor his boss. And guess what? It still went bad. This is how a move of God happens. Hmm. How many people have given up on this journey? How many people have given up on this journey because they're thinking like, oh my goodness, now I'm like, I'm in the front page of the papers and my boss's wife is lying to everybody saying that, that our, she was saying that he raped her, and he, he ran from her. Mm -hmm. He ran from her. But yet she was, he was being accused of sexual crime that wasn't true. But guess what? He, the boss still sends him to jail. How many people would go, well, I'm not going to listen to a prophetic word from Joseph anymore. He really didn't hear a dream what's going on. I mean, he's just trying to destroy what God's saying. All these lies are being told against him. And he's trying to get him to not believe anymore, trying to get his brothers and his family not to believe anymore. But guess what? After a couple of years of being in prison, of course he gets promoted in prison, he's running the prison, God's got a move coming. All of a sudden, the leader, Pharaoh, mm -hmm. God says, now. And what does he do? Just like he did with Elijah. He tells the, the leader of, of the government, you got a problem coming that you can't solve. 
He told him in his sleep, in a dream, he said, this is an unbeliever who had a dream. So don't tell me unbelievers can't have a dream. And just because you have a dream don't mean you're a believer. So he's talking to the government, head of the government, Pharaoh, and he's saying, you got a drought coming. But he didn't even understand that. He had some skinny cows and some fat cows and the fat, skinny cows were eating the fat cows and all this different kind of stuff. And so God put it on Pharaoh's heart to turn and ask people around him, says, do you know anybody that can interpret dreams? And guess what? There was a prisoner who was accused, accused of a sexual crime who used to be a slave, unpaid labor, mm -hmm. who was rejected by his family and father and had this, this, this horrific time pit, preachers and dreams, serious time. You know, all of a sudden he said, Joseph, he's the one. Yeah. And they took him, cleaned him up, bought him out of jail, stood him before the governmental leader and said, uh, I had a dream last night. I mean, how many people at that point just go, I don't even care, I don't even want to hear, I don't want to You don't understand how God works. Listen, I, I just feel like right now God's breathing new life into you. I mean, you went on this journey and you're thinking, and everybody's agreeing with it because they don't have a clue, they haven't heard the voice of God, but you've heard the voice of God, and you know what He said to you, despite what everybody else said to you about what He said, and you all want to encourage you. Realize God was letting you in on what He's doing. You're not telling, you weren't telling God what you're going to do. He was telling you, he was telling you what he's going to do. He was inviting you into his plans. He revealed to you, like he says in Proverbs 1, he, was, he, he says, I reveal my secrets to you. And, and when he reveals his secrets to you, don't think, you go, oh my goodness, I got I to gotta hold his secret because it'll fall apart. You know, oh, this, I think this low paid wage job is going to cause me to lose this thing. Or, oh my gosh, they're lying about me and accusing me of false things and twisting everything I say or do. Oh my goodness, what's going to happen? Or just like, I'm tired of it because I got a call in my life. The enemy's just pounding me. Just say, you know what? I can't do this sin against God. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to trust God through this whole thing. And so when he appears before the government, just like Elijah had to, and the Pharaoh says, this is my dream. He says, I can't interpret dreams, but God can interpret dreams. And, and God gave him the interpretation. He said, you've got seven years of famine coming. And then Joseph said, you need to find somebody that has the wisdom to be able to run this government. And of course, he wasn't promoting himself at all. At that point, he's just like, you know. And then the government says, I can't find nobody but you. I mean, who would be the one? If you're the one that can hear God, you run this thing. And so Joseph began to, he was the second man in charge. Over an entire nation. The one that his father rejected That's when right. he told him the story. His brother sold him into slavery and hated him. The one, the, 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 the Slavery is a bad paying job if you don't know that. And he, he's accused of sexual crime. If it was today, they would have him on the, 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 the predator, mm -hmm. or what are those called, database. Joseph would be on that database because they lied on him. And so you look at this, and now he's second man in charge. Don't let anybody stop you from believing the Word of God and what he says. And here he is, the second man in charge. And what happened? His entire family. His entire nation, all of his people, all of God's people, because Joseph did not let go of what God said. Because Elijah didn't let go of what God said. You think about it. Are you letting go of what God says? Are you allowing this crazy stuff going on right now to define the famine, to define what God said to you? Are you thinking like, man, it's about to rain. It's about to rain. Pharaoh's about to ring up myself. I'm about to get a text from the White House. <laughs> right? It's about to rain. And he, everybody began to bring all the food to Joseph. Joseph began to store up all the food that there ever was. They brought it to him and they began to sell their property to him and everything became under Joseph. Mm -hmm. And his family came in, the nation came in and they gave them the best land, the best place and they didn't do anything for it. But they benefited off of Joseph hanging in there and holding on to what God was doing. I, I, I hear this young girl right now. I remember she was saying this. She was going like, what do you hear? Elijah sent his servant out and says, what do you hear? And he starts like, you know, I hear the sound of rain. That's right. this is, this is, this, I want you to just hear this in your voice. Hear this in your ear. Hear this in your heart. Begin to say this. Listen to her. I hear the abundance of rain. I hear the abundance of rain. I hear the abundance of rain. I want to ask you, what are you hearing? I'm hearing the abundance, abundance of rain. Of rain. Right. I'm seeing 
a cloud the size of a man hand, man's hand. I'm telling you, you better get to where you need to get before the rain comes because you're going to miss the move mm -hmm. of God, what God's about to do on the face of the earth. I want to encourage you. If you don't know Jesus, you need to go to meetmyfather.org and find out how to make him God, the Lord of your life, through Jesus, the Lord of your life through Jesus Christ. You got to know Father God. Go to meetmyfather.org where we shared our testimonies. You got to get discipled. We have a Mayus Road for you. It's a, go to vinefellowshipnetwork.org. You can see it right here on your screen. And sign up for a Mayus Road and, and start being a disciple. Get ready because it's going to rain. You need to know how to swim. And you want to be a part of the most exciting thing that ever happened on the face of the earth. But let me pray for you right now. Father God, I, I just even hear, even now, the sound of rain. I see clouds the size of men's hands. That you are not, I thank you, Lord, that you're not a man, that you would lie or the son of man, that you would change your mind, that you don't speak and not act and promise and not fulfill. And this drought does not define who we are and does not define where we're going. God, and I just thank you right now that people that weren't hungry are hungry now and they're crying out to you, God. And I pray that rain would begin to come in their prayer life, rain would begin to come in their mind, their mental capabilities, God, that the rain of heaven would come down over their marriage and their family and their kids and their home and their job, and rain would come down. Revival, a great awakening would come down over this nation, God. Lord, we're just calling down the fire from heaven, yes. God, to come down. Fuego, yes. fire to come down from heaven over this nation, God, and begin to burn the dross out, Father God, and set our hearts on fire for what's going to be taking place, God. We thank you, God, that everything you said has happened, is happening, and is going to happen, Father God, and we trust you in this, dear God. Send revival. Send a third great awakening, we pray. In Jesus' name, God bless. Thank you for watching VFN TV. If you like this video, give us a thumbs up. Also, if you want to see more videos like this, subscribe. You know, a lot of people want to abide with the Lord, but they just don't have a plan to do it. You can request that plan today at iabide.org. Don't forget you can join us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Download our app and sign up for our newsletter, The Torch at vfntv.com.